Well, welcome. We continue in the silly season. Um, we have another person who has stepped up and said they're willing to put their own time and a lot of energy into helping our community. Uh, I think my hat's off to this year nine people running, seven on school, two on selectmen, and I hope that you'll agree that we should thank every one of them, regardless of the outcome, for stepping up to help us. So let's start with an introduction. Uh, thank you, Al. John Erickson here tonight, candidate for Board of Selectmen. Now, it's been a few times now that you've been on during different elections. Yes, I've been uh, a little bit of a frequent flyer here with my, um, my endeavors to, be, you know, to serve in an elected capacity. Well, you were famous the first time when it was 13 vote difference. Yes. And then you came back and drew top top votes in this next election. Yes, uh, that was you know uh, a little bit more rewarding than the first go around. <laughs> but again, you know, as I say, I have to say thank you for being one of the few that actually stand up and are willing to put their actions behind their words. Well, um, I would say it's a, it's a pleasure to attempt to serve. It's, it's, it's something that's really um, an eye-opening experience your first go around when you just feel that you have something to contribute and you, you jump into you know, a bid for an election. You, you lay yourself out in the line, you lay your family out to some extent, and, um, but in hindsight, it's, it's one of the most rewarding John, experiences. If anybody ever said no good deed goes unpunished, so you go through this, you draw top votes, and then you get to be on the school committee for years and take yeah. all the, okay. the arrows that come with that. There's some arrows, but um, hopefully, you know, a candidate knows what they stepped up for, and I certainly did. I had a lot of government experience prior to that, so uh, I was comfortable with what I was getting into, more so serving than running. Running was completely foreign. Serving felt very comfortable almost from day one. So as we start, the first question you know is always the same. I do. John, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? Well, to answer that question, Al, um, I think you have to know who I am and who any candidate is and, and what we bring to the table. So um, I've been here before. Um, many of your viewers have, have heard it in the past, but I'll try and briefly run through it. Um, born and raised in Milford, product of the Milford School System, graduate from WPI, um, spent many years as an electrical contractor, uh, and then in 2005 joined the, joined the building department and, um, I'm sorry, 2004, serving as the local building commissioner. Did that for eight years, moved into the role of building commissioner, Stir served in that role for six years, a and that experience really gave me um, some insight that I think is is very valuable towards serving an elected in an elected capacity. Uh, it let me learn government uh, in a way that's not typical from the inside out, which most elected officials um, just follow a different path. You know, I saw a need to contribute, so back in 2014, I ran for school committee. In 2015, on my second attempt, I was elected, and I think that elected service just furthered my, my insight into <coughs> town government, collaboration with others. So I think you have to look at my, my life experiences as a business owner, as a public um, official, both appointed and elected, and look at what I bring to the table to serve as your next selectman. Um, and unlike last year, this I'm in a position right now where I'll either continue my, my public service as an elected official, or if I'm not successful, I'll be you know, following a different path and I'm out of town government you know, for the time being for a while. Or, or indefinitely or forever. So I think, I think it's all of my, my combination of experience, knowledge that um, would just let me serve the citizens and residents and taxpayers of Milford in a, um, in a very informed position. Now, you made a conscience decision. You're on the school committee. You were, I mean, pretty surprising that the first time you ever went for election, you came within 13 votes. And now, the second time, you broke the bank. You're a top vote getter. Why give up school committee for selectmen? Well, it's, um, you know, when I ran for school committee, you have to realize that I, I saw a need. Um, 
I saw some of the trials and tribulations of, of past school committees and a little bit of discord there. I saw the, the, the needs of the school, which were well documented at the time, what to do with Middle School East, the IT deficiencies, and, and others that have already been discussed. And I thought I could, you know, serve well there. And, and I feel that I have. But through my service there, I realized that the knowledge that I bring on the town government side is um, much more broad and in-depth than what I brought to the school committee. I, 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 again, I'm very proud of what I brought to the school committee, and I'm very proud of what uh, our committee has done as a whole, and that, again, has been you know, discussed at length. But my real strength there is my knowledge of town government. During the budget process, it was, I was very vocal. During contract negotiations, I was very vocal. And, and I think part of it is because I look at the perspective of the whole town, not just what as, as a school committee we want to do for our, for our teachers, what we want to do um, to, to add programs, but what can we afford as a town? So it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a broader, it's a broader look down at the, at the big picture. And again, my strength was definitely um, my knowledge and my familiarity of town government. So that, that was my inspiration. And when I saw the needs that I saw from working at town hall, the challenges, the, um, uh, what's recognized as problems both by myself and, and other colleagues there, um, that was to me um, either a natural progression or just um, you know, a bit of a calling where I feel I can contribute, I feel I can um, help improve things from where they are today. So that's, that was my inspiration to move from school committee to, to Board of Selectmen. Now you had some distinct goals when you joined the school committee. Selectmen. Are there specific areas you want to approach, change, improve? Oh, absolutely. I mean, to me, uh, the biggest problem we face right now is that we don't have a comprehensive plan as a community. We had one. We have one, technically. It was developed in 2002. It was published in 2003. Some of those goals and objectives have been met, but many of those goals and objectives have been met with resistance. So um, I think almost every other issue falls within developing a comprehensive plan. I don't think we can you know, plan proper financing without a comprehensive plan of where we're going as a community. I think any of the problems that we're going to discuss or we have discussed in the, path, in the past would fall within a proper comprehensive plan. If you take any one issue, it's really just a stab at a problem. There's a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, but we need to develop, redevelop this plan, um, which was developed again in 2002 by a team of, of professionals uh, from UMass, you know, professors there, uh, doctorate candidates, other students, uh, other professionals outside of, of UMass. And it, it's really a, it was a really big endeavor and I don't think it ever gained enough support, enough embracing. Again, met with too much resistance, and I think we need to uh, redevelop the plan. I don't want to say come up with a new plan because many of those issues that were brought up then still exist today. 16 years later? Yes. If you had the magic wand and you could change one thing, what would it be? If I could change one thing, it would be the, the dynamic of the, the leadership and the lack of collaboration in this town between various boards, committees, department heads. I don't think there's enough collaboration. I think the answers are there. I think we need to work better together to get to identifying the problems, agreeing on the problems, and agreeing on a course of action. But now, most towns around us seem not to be as unified as Milford. So it seems strange when you talk about boards not cooperating. In uh, what way? In what way? I, I mean, I'd prefer to talk about, I guess, the board that I'm running for. 
Okay. I don't feel that they've embraced our professionals within the town. I don't feel that they've embraced our town planner. I don't believe that they've embraced our town administrator. I don't believe that they've embraced advice that's come from town council. Um, when you look at, again, the comprehensive plan, it's almost a, it's almost where it starts and everything else is an offshoot and a, and a, and a, and a rung or a division of that. I, um, when you, you know, again, I bring a different insight. I work in the town, I worked for many years in the town hall. I don't work there anymore for those who don't know that. Um, again, former building commissioner and I, I resigned um, last August to, you know, pursue other professional avenues. But there, there isn't, we're, we're not embracing, we're not listening to, um, in a complete context, what our, again, what our professionals are, are recommending. And that goes to, you know, our finance director, it, our police chief in some ways. It, it really starts at the top. And I think there's a com complete disconnect from the leadership to town government. But if somebody was to ask you, how's Milford doing? Over, what would you? Overall, I'd say we're doing well. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say otherwise, but I think some of the decisions that have been made recently, we won't see the effects for, for years to come. And they're all, there isn't one profound decision that's going to, you know, um, destroy this town. But it, it's, it's, it's like many things in life. It's not one donut. It's not one cookie that's going to make you gain weight. It's a, it's a. Hey, you're looking at me when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's when you put it all together. A lot of bad decisions will catch up with you, and and it takes some time to figure that out, and then you're in the oh no phase. Can the selectman's office make those kind of changes in town? Directly, immediately, no. They can affect all of those changes, positive changes. And again, it comes back to we need to sort of define and choose where we're going in the future. We do have a chance to um, better shape our direction. Again, I don't want to say we're in an overall bad condition, but I think we could be in much better condition. And I really do fear for where we're going in the years ahead. The effects. I think the effects of poor decisions are cumulative, and they'll take, they'll take years to unfold. Any specific area that we should worry about? Uh, just the, again, I don't want to be negative. It's not. Well, no, but John, just because we got an A doesn't mean we don't go for an A plus. So it's not like you're saying Milford's got an F. No, well, Mil Milford's in very good shape, especially financially. Um, but in part, we may be in financial sh very good financial shape because of things that we've left on the table. Let's go back to the financial, uh, not the financial, the, the comprehensive plan, right? We just, we just purchased th or appropriated the money to purchase three buildings on Central Street um, without a further plan on what to do with them, or at least uh, not one that's set in stone, not one that funding's been approved for. Um, and that problem was identified in 2003. And I, I get it comes from the efforts of trying to improve downtown, but improving downtown was part of the, the plan in 2003. And now it's really gone nowhere. There was a lot of, and I have that comprehensive plan, I've read it thoroughly, and I have my highlights, I have my underlines, I have my notes, I have my, my sidebars, uh, was really never embraced. And it's clearly been a topic, especially of political season for the last however many years. But you know, we've relied on a group of business owners, residents, to, to try and take that, that plan and do, uh, take, not take that plan, come up with a plan to do something. And it's a, you know, probably a great first step to, to purchase these buildings, but for what? Again, there's no plan. We're taking a stab at something, and I understand the need to improve downtown, but th th this should be part of a much bigger plan. Any ideas on what we could do to make downtown more vibrant, more, just more attractive? Well, of course, there's a lot of things we want to do, right? We want to promote retail, especially on first floor um, stories of downtown. We want to improve parking to, in order to 
facilitate retail on these on these in these buildings. Um, there was a you know there's been a lot of there's been a lot of ideas brought forward by town planner that were met again with resistance. So you know if you look at most of the successful downtowns, they allow for housing on the upper apartments. levels, apartments on the upper levels, and that <clears> may <throat> sound you know undesirable at first glance. When you have to look at what these apartments would would have to, but John, why? Why I, I never understood what is undesirable about having apartments on Main Street. To me, there isn't anything. But I, that's a perception from a lot of people that I've talked to. The, the knee jerk reaction is that's not desirable. I assume that's why it wasn't that plan wasn't embraced by our leadership in the past. It's been brought forward by town planner, and you have to realize that if you're going to put apartments on the upper levels of Main Street, they need to meet building codes, accessibility codes, they need to be sprinkled, they need to have elevators. These are not shotgun units that a landlord can just immediately profit from. These it's part gonna, of a bigger... They're not going to be slum apartments. They can't be with the expense that has to be outlaid to create them. So um, I, well, I can't see why I it's been opposed. to build up restaurants and air, stores downtown, Boy, it seems logical that if I have people living within walking distance, it's just going to help the stores. Well, it's, it's a formula that's worked in, in many other towns. So um, that's what the professional planners advocate. I don't see why it's undesirable. I don't see why it hasn't been, ex if not embraced, at least explored in a, a lot more depth. But, you know, these are the things that I you know, I kind of take exception with that haven't been uh, on our forefront. Well, you mentioned financial. Uh, I'll put you on the spot. There's those uh, profane phrases that, you know, we constantly, at least a number of us, say we don't like profanity used in the uh, room three when the FinCom is there. So prop two and a half and debt exclusion. To me, profanity. What's your opinion? Uh, I'm going to expound on that. And the politically correct answer is I oppose them adamantly and I would never vote for either one. But if we, if we look into it a little bit deeper, and I've said this uh, at least last year on this show, there could be a place for debt exclusion. You have to understand what debt exclusion is, and I know that you do, um, given your background. But explain it to the people. So... If you're going to undertake a project, say the Woodland School, you have one chance to vote for a debt exclusion, which allows you to someday, if another vote is taken, vote for a debt exclusion in case there's times where you know, the budget is tight, state aid doesn't come in where it should be, and it allows you to control where that money would go. So if you don't vote for a debt exclusion at the beginning of a project. And if things go, you know, much worse than projected between uh, uh, new growth and state aid and all the other factors that come into play, you're, you're at a point where you either have to vote for a two and a half override or you need to cut from other places to, to pay for this debt. Voting up front for a debt exclusion would allow you to then vote in the future for a debt exclusion to cover that debt. I'm not saying I would advocate for it in general. It would be a very difficult decision, but it was something I would look at very, very closely before ruling it out. And again, that's for a one-time project, so to speak, a Woodland School, to use that example. And you have that one year to vote on possibly allowing it in the future. So there, there is a time to consider it. But overall, no, I would not. Of course, it's, those are dirty words. You wouldn't ever want to support debt exclusion or two and a half override. But in a way, we do it every year when we tuck away money. We push off the need. You know, when you think of Woodland, we did the entire Woodland project, and we didn't have to use profanity because we saved for eight or ten years. We did, and that's, you know, we're in such good financial shape with the, the stabilization accounts uh, that that's, you know, that's, I guess, I don't want to say your first line of defense, but that's, that's um, proper planning. We're looking at probably the biggest 
acquisition this town has ever faced, the water company. Any opinion? Well, my, my opinion from day one on the water company is that it's a big risk. Uh, the, the, the potential for risk is bigger than the potential for reward. But I do think if everything was executed properly, it is the right thing to do. And that included, you know, taking, factoring into consideration the purchase price and factoring into how it's going to be operated and managed. And that seemed to start off, you know, or not start off, but that seemed to be executing well um, until recently when, you know, it was going to be uh, a purchase of one type and the water company said no, so now we basically have an appeal at the, or we have a, we have a filing at the SJC uh, for the, for the um, DPU to set the purchase price. Do you believe the water company really wants to go through with the deal? I, I don't, I guess no, otherwise they would have, because they could have. And my gut feeling says somebody finally looked and said, we could get 10 or 20 million more if we sold it on the open market? Well, he, I mean, here's, here's the question that's, that's been plaguing that potential purchase for, for a few years. The, the purchase price of 63 million, roughly, was, was uh, um, uh, that purchase price was, um, came to be because of the actions of a mediator, which means that the purchase price was agreeable to both parties which is somewhat different than an arbitrator, which, which would really set the value of that water company. So we, you know, there's a lot of background and research that went into saying that, yeah, it is worth 63 million, but, you know, there's arguments that it's worth 53 or 73. So, you know, by going forward in this capacity, uh, the DPU will, will set the price, and then I guess we'll have a real value, and that price could go up or could go down. And along with that, this, this delay in the purchase, if it does come to be, uh, could be six months or one year for a decision. Uh, and and there's, there's always a potential for appeal. So I don't know that the water company is going anywhere quickly, or the acquisition of the water company is going anywhere quickly. Another building, Middle School East. Middle School East. You have now have looked at it for, well, now you're looking at it from the selectman's point of view. You looked at it from the school's point of view. You looked at it from the resident's point of view. Um, I think I think that the town gave up on middle school east too soon. I advocated last year for, you know, further study into possible uses, in of if not of that building of that site for town use. You know, coming from the town hall, uh, and I was there today doing doing some business. The town hall is is out of space. Everybody there is, you know, cramped to say the least, and we could get into that. But the question is, what are we going to do as we go forward, as we, as we are, if we add personnel, as storage and paper records are already being outsourced and we're, pay we're paying private companies to store them? You know, I had the vision last year, I guess I still have the vision of either a municipal center or a, or a town hall annex at another nearby location, whether that's the middle school east site, um, probably not in its current configuration because it's way too large of a building and way too many modifications that need to be made. But to me, that, that wasn't even considered. Um, after the school committee declared its surplus, turned it over to the Board of Selectmen, really nothing happened. An RFP was developed you know, throughout, through, uh, within the town hall that wasn't acted on for six or nine months. Uh, the RFP was put out, and exactly one proposal was received. So we're gonna we're gonna sell that building for uh, very short money, and we didn't really look at all of our uses, potential uses, from a municipal standpoint. You know, there was that study from years ago that looked at the best use outside of for the most part, outside of municipal use. And they didn't come up with any real strong conclusions of what it's good for. In fact, the, you know, the proposal that came in, um, option number one is, is raising it and creating a new pad site.
I guess I heard that people had looked at, okay, we need space in the town hall. We need space in the high school. And I wondered if it didn't make sense to divvy up the building. Because everybody seems to say we need the gym. So leave the gym alone. And then cut the building into thirds. Give a third to the town hall, a third to administrative, you know, central office of the school. And you still got some space left over. Absolutely. That's something, again, I did bring up last year. Uh, it was a strong consideration because um, in many communities that the um, school department administration and town government administration share the same building. Um, they do in Natick, just for one example. I know that the constant communication needed between the finance department at the town hall and central office at the school is essentially all day, every day. It would be much more effective for them to be in the same building down the hall or, or up an elevator away from each other. And in the gym, you know, it, there's always a need for more gyms or at least a want. So that's, these are options that I don't think gained any discussion. And they were brought, I brought it up. And, you know, they didn't, not that my idea is profound, but it didn't gain any traction anywhere. And after the school declared its surplus, simply an RFP, from my mind, uh, an RFP and went out to bid, got one bid, and it appears like, you know, that's a proposal that will be accepted. And what will happen to the building? Again, the proposal calls, they were, there's several, when you submit a proposal like that, the developer has to submit several options. Option number one is, is to knock the building down and build, build a new structure that complies with zoning, whatever they want to put in there. But then what happens to our gym? Gym's gone. Mm. I mean. And then what happens to when we want to, well, before I make that assumption, size of town government, too big, just right, too small? Uh, right now it's growing unnecessarily. Okay, now you've, you, you've tweaked me. Well, if we go to years past, uh, again, something else I've said here before, we, we created a townside IT department. Uh, I was at town hall when that decision was made, and it was one individual. It since has grown to two individuals, and I was there when th we had a consultant taking care of all of the issues um, for far less than that, you know, all the value of one employee took. And again, you and I have talked about this here and probably other places. We're talking about an IT department at town hall that doesn't take care of schools and doesn't take care of public safety. And this is not in any way a knock on that individual or those individuals there. It's a knock on the concept of creating this department. And we've talked before about how much does one employee, one department head cost over, the, over their lifetime of employment? Uh, we said something like $3 million between salary, benefits, retirement. And I didn't see a need. Other people in town hall didn't see a need. So that's something I've, I've spoken out against in the past. It's something I still think was unnecessary. Now there's a proposal for an HR director or an HR department. It's being carried into budget season, and it's been well documented on how little, by some, on how little need there is for that individual or that department, given our infrastructure, given our benefits department. So again, to me, it's growing government unnecessarily. It's an added cost to the taxpayers that could either be saved or better spent elsewhere. But is that addition really driven by a backlash against personnel department or personnel committee? Why is somebody trying to add, <laughs> essentially <coughs> replacing the personnel board? Well, you're not replacing the personnel board unless you, unless you modify many of our town bylaws. Then our, what would an HR person do? 
uh, that's a question that I'm looking for the answer to. From all my research, it would it would do tasks. It would maybe undertake some tasks that are already being performed by existing infrastructure. Now I saw there was contention over you know the raises that we need raises to be competitive, but we are competitive. It was totally confusing to me as a resident as to why I'm raising salaries in this area and that area. Would an HR person fix that? Well, again, an HR person doesn't remove the personnel board unless we change our, our general bylaws within the town. Um, but why would you hire a, I guess my problem is, if you're going to go through and put an HR director, it's an expensive post, mm -hmm. and you keep the volunteers that are doing all the work, something seems disconnected there seems like a big disconnect again I haven't seen any 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 justification for an HR department or director that I can buy into at this point we have a personnel board we've had a personnel board since 1950 something ish um, and overall they've always done a fair job for their employees there's some 50 some odd employees that fall under the personnel board and it's in their charge to do a compensation and classification study every so many years Again, in our general bylaws, anybody can read them online. I've read them, ex you know, front to back several times. I don't always remember every detail in there, but this this is what we've had in place for many years. Now, I have disagreed with some of the conclusions that the personnel board has drawn. That doesn't mean that I disagree with the. the have you premise. ever have you ever agreed or disagreed with every decision that every <coughs> board has made? No. <laughs> I don't even know if I've ever agreed with every decision I've made. <laughs> but, you know, I don't think there's any great change that needs to be made. I think if people have concerns, and I'm a person as a former town employee, when they were doing the compensation and classification study, I disagreed with their approach long before the results were published. I had no idea what salary the building commissioner would end up with at the time. But as I listened to the consultant early in the process, as we were invited to, I disagreed with some of their approach, and I voiced it, and I voiced it later in the process, and we were supposed to have a voice at the end of the process, um, which I never did get that opportunity to speak, but it didn't matter. I wasn't arguing the results. I was arguing some of their methods. So I would, you know, I would express that them, to them again today. I expressed it to them then. But we don't need to overhaul town government because we disagree with the salary of one person or several people or all of them. We need to, you know, maybe uh, impart our thoughts on how they came to their conclusions. But, Joe, when I think of an HR person and on a commercial side and industrial side, they do more than just deal with salaries. They do. Um, would this person then take on the whole town HR role? No. Um, in fact, they have a limited role town-wide, and that's been, that's been expressed in memos from town council explaining that um, the, on the school side, for example, they would, have no, they, they would have no jurisdiction, no impact. It's not, it's not a town-wide HR. The unions um, would not would not really have them as a resource in many capacities. And th these are published memos. Well, I mean, that's 60 percent of our entire population, just the school. And the, and if you add the various unions, it, it's up to about 90 percent. I mean, I forget the exact number of town employees, but it's, it's I don't know, eight, nine hundred, and we're talking 50 to 56 that so a this HR person, you're saying, would only deal with 50 people? Yes. Okay, something doesn't... This old man here is confused. Well, the, Why the, would we have a HR person to deal with 50 people? Um, I, again, I'm waiting for that justification because I can't see any reason to. You know, the, the, the HR person or department would grow government. It would replace... Uh, an appointed board that receives uh, 
a very small stipend every year for their participation and brings a, a, a broad um, set of resources to the table. They're all professionals. Um, they have so much uh, varying professional and life experiences. That's how this that's how this board was formed, and you know what what specifically? Give me an example of a a serious problem that can't be overcome right now. I don't know of one, because somehow we always seem. I mean, you've been on the school committee, and everybody says, "Oh, school committee never disagrees with FinCom," and I laugh. Publicly, no, but you've been in some of those meetings where they're less than pleasant. Oh, ab absolutely, and that's that's. I guess that's the essence of government, right? Being able to listen to everyone's opinion and and coming to a conclusion that is for the greater good. And not everybody's going to always agree. And sometimes more people are going to disagree, and and one side's going to come over to the other. I mean, this came up in in teacher negotiations at my last meeting, you know, somebody put out an idea. I, I didn't agree with it initially. By the time we finished discussing it, um, okay, now I can see the value in that. So, again, to go back to personnel uh, developing an HR individual or department, it, it seems just like unnecessary growth of government, and uh, it, it takes away you know, a board of people with, with ideas and input. So I, I, I don't see the value. As we talk about services that have increased, we put a bus in. Have you followed the bus? Uh, not literally. <laughs> um, and yes, casually. Um, the, the bus was a controversial decision, you know, regional transportation initially. And to me, the jury is still out on that decision. I don't think anybody disagrees that we have a population in Milford that we need to help. Um, the special needs community came in front of the FinCom and explained how valuable it was to some of the special needs kids that they now can get around to their jobs. How valuable it was because the parents were set a little bit free. So, I mean, I've always had the opinion that Public transportation is something we ought to do. The question is, is the bus the right way to do it? I'd agree with that wholeheartedly. You know, what's the cost and how many are benefiting and how many are, are taking advantage of it and what are the alternatives? Well, and again, the question came up. We're spending a quarter million dollars, mm -hmm. which is about, I think it's down to about $24 a ride or, and I, it could be even better now because we haven't gotten an update for a few months. And the question was, was the Milford Uber a better alternative? And I don't mean Uber itself, but, you know, something yeah. where somebody picks up the phone, calls down to the senior center or somewhere and says, I need to go from my home to my doctor or somewhere, pays a dollar, and we could subsidize one heck of a lot of rides. We could, and that's something to be strongly considered. You know, if you're talking about it just on a senior level, uh, who are we leaving out that's currently benefiting? But I think there's there's a lot more to consider with public transportation than, than what we have already. Um, and I honestly don't have a commitment one way or the other on how to proceed, but uh, I, I think it's something that needs more attention going forward. Um, but than do you less. believe we should have because I use the word senior center, I should have said police station. It doesn't matter. Because the fundamental question, should we provide transportation to those who can't? I mean, the easy answer is yes. And, and I mean, that's the essence of every city, public transportation. Um, the cities wouldn't survive without it in, in, in some in in some levels. You know, if you're in rural America, obviously public transportation doesn't work. So we're somewhere in between, and it makes it a much harder decision. So uh, we, I would need more information. First of all, I'd need more proposals on what we're going to do. With, with the current infrastructure, we have, we have, 
you know, three choices, I guess. Keep it going as is, cut it completely, or, or modify the money that we're putting into it now towards a different avenue, as you say, Milford or Uber. And the reason I bring up, I, I focused on senior, because some of the proposals or the, you know, not formal proposals, but the ideas and notions that I've heard is that, you know, we do something through the senior center, but that, you know, from the feedback I've gotten, that would limit it to seniors using that transportation. So I was maybe a little presumptuous in, in yeah, answering your question. Yeah, I may be question. using the wrong, saying the senior center. Um, you could run it out of police department, fire department, anywhere public. Because I would hate for us to limit it, you know, to a group of people. I am concerned that somebody like my mother, if she ever wanted to use it, there's no way she can walk two miles to the nearest stop. Yeah, and that was that was well stated by at least one resident during during this discussion a few years ago when we did approve it. Um, and he gave the example of where his mother lived and where he would, she would have to pick up the bus, and it's just not feasible. Period. So we need to look at those situations in, in more depth and and figure out who's who's benefit or how not who but how many people are benefit benefiting and what are again other options i mean it could be a better option and this is bold but cut public transportation altogether and put those resources into something else and i'm not advocating for that but that these are the things you have to look at what are we trying to do for the you know the greater good of the community when you look that way if i asked you what do you think the biggest or the three biggest challenges or opportunities we have to fundamentally help the residents of Milford. Life at the center of the universe could be changed by, what would you say? Uh, it comes down to what I said earlier, proper planning. We don't have effective and proper planning right now. We, we react more than we are proactive. Um, taking any one opportunity today probably would, would make for a great campaign promise, but issues change every year. Look at what we were talking about last year at this time. Look at what we were talking two, three, and four years ago. These are, many of them are one-time issues that we're reacting to. So our, the biggest opportunity is to, is to plan properly going forward and, and define where we want to go as a community. And that, that involves taking it considerations from all of our residents. You know, I, I, I firmly believe that all of our residents don't have a voice right now. Some residents, some groups, so to speak, um, get a little undue attention. But how do you get them to step up so they are more visible? I mean, I can say it because I'm Portuguese. The Portuguese community has a horrible voting record. Not that overall the town is a great one, but, you know. <laughs> you think? <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> you know, when you start thinking about an election where 12% of the eligible voters, you know, and you're here, so I, I don't want to pick on you, but 13 votes. You sit there when people say, well, I don't know if my vote matters. Yeah, what do we have, 14 or 17,000 registered yeah. voters and, and, and 3,000 come out? So, um, you know, it, that's a little discouraging, but it's, it's not that... And I see, I, I think you just touched on the essence of the problem is that the squeaky wheel gets the, the, the grease of the oil. The, the residents or the special interest groups that step up carry a lot of clout because nobody else is saying anything. And I think our leadership isn't looking far enough at, you know, issues that touch all of the community. They're, they're also reacting. You know, we have residents and groups reacting to an issue that... that um, is very important to them at the moment and we've seen this progress and they, that then you know one individual loses interest and then another issue comes up and somebody comes forward that's very vocal and I I don't think that our you know our elected officials are are cognizant of the entire community at all times but yet I mean we've got a selectman from the Heights we have you've got some people from areas that really need a voice you've got a selectman, I mean, all of them are from Milford. You know, I mean, this whole definition of what's a Milfordian, 
and put that aside. Yeah, I know, I laughed because I told my daughter, I said, Lexi, you're finally a true Milfordian. You're third generation Milford, and you live within two miles of your mother. <laughs> so, so now you qualify. But it's not like people blew in to run town government who have never been in Milford. No, they've, they've been in Milford, but I don't think they're, they're looking at the big picture in the entire community. I, I think their focus is, is unduly inf influenced in many topics. But how would you change that? Um, I would come forward to, in order to represent the whole community. And it, it's part of my experience in town government. For f 14 years I sat there. I didn't know who was coming through the door, for what reason. I, the issue could be minor to me, it's major to them, and I always gave every single person the same attention that came through there, whether it was the, the architect for the for Milford Regional or whether it was somebody with a complaint about their next door neighbor. And when you take that, that, that um, sort of level response where everybody gets the same consideration, I think you're, you're starting on a different page. But again, I wonder because I would love to see I mean, obviously, I'm Portuguese, so I want to see the Portuguese have a lot more say because there's a large population. But we have Ecuadorians, we have Guatemalans, we have Brazilians. And as bad as our overall voting is, those blocks are even lower. How do you get them involved? Well, I mean, when you say you'd like to see someone, some particular group have more say, Everybody has the same say on one day every year for town yes. government. That's the first Tuesday in April, which is election day. Um, after that, it's up to your elected officials to give consideration where they feel it's important. It, it's really that simple. What, what's your agenda and in, in who are you representing and how? But you know, I don't have a lot of exposure to different parts of Milford's ethnic groups. But I'd love to see the Guatemalan community, the Ecuadorian community, more involved so we know what's going on in that community. What can we do to leverage their talents? Well, you know, of course you'd like equal participation throughout. But years ago at this point, I, I went with the police chief um, and, and met a group of you know, the ethnic, ethnic background that you're talking about at St. Mary's Church with one of the priests, and we heard some of their considerations. Uh, I don't know if our current board has ever done that, um, but I went with the police chief and several other town officials, uh, I believe Board of Health and probably fire, and we listened to a broad range of concerns, some that, you know, um, I could lend some insight onto. And it's honestly been so many years, I'm going to say three or four, that I can't give you specifics, but um, where is where is that search? I don't know if there is a search for that, but that's how you would get more input from. You have to embrace these, you know, these diverse groups if you want to hear their thoughts. Well, I mean, I was amazed to find out that we have a large Coptic pot. You know, that people are using St. Mary's Church at midnight for masses because there's a lot of people that work nights, the Egyptian community and pizza and all, and they get out at 11.30, so mass is held at midnight or 12.30. I had no clue. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know that either. Only because I'm on the finance board at St. Mary's, it came up. Okay. And I mean, I thought it was great that we have another community that is kind of embraced Milford, but... Like you say, I want all of them to have a voice. I want to know, you know, as a resident, what are we doing to help everybody? And what are they doing to help Milford? Yeah, I mean, and that, I guess that's the essence of, of government. But, you know, people need to, to reach out to, to their elected officials and, and voice their concerns. And that goes back to what I said earlier, is that people are doing that, but... Um, not enough of you know not not enough of a broad range of concerns, and you know I think there's a little un, again undue focus on some of these groups. But now, when you talk about focus, there's a lot of people who have strong opinions, 
about the whole immigration situation in Milford. Can the selectmen do anything about that? The, se the selectmen can help manage the effects of, of the immigration. Uh, I don't know how much more you can do. The biggest effects are at the school system, as we've discussed in the past. You know, immigration control starts on the federal level and, you know, to the state on, uh, you know, filters down to the state on other, in other levels. But um, there's really not a lot that a, the local board of selectmen can do you to can't deport to, people to, to Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> Still no. <laughs> I mean, I get such a kick out of it when I hear people say the selectmen should fix this immigration issue. Uh, last time I looked, they don't have the power to deport to Rhode Island or New Hampshire. Yeah, and there's there's only so much any elected official or any elected board can do to fix, you know, a perceived problem. You know, and I ran through that in my in my years of of town employment. You need to fix this. Well, that's not a violation, so there's nothing I can fix. And that that happened weekly, it, monthly, certainly weekly, probably sometimes daily. You need to fix this. This isn't right. Well, I it, don't like the light my neighbor put in his front porch. That's been mo several several complaints. Um, it's ugly. John, your building inspector, go fix it. You know, the, the perception of a violation or, or a wrongdoing isn't always reality. And, you know, you do your best to educate. You do your best to explain. And um, unfortunately, in situations like that, you have, you know, a 49, 51 percent success failure rate or satisfaction dissatisfaction rate you know not unlike the umpire in, in, in many days but um, sometimes there's not much you can do to change what somebody s sees as a problem but you can at least help them understand it and, uh, and explain you know what's allowed what's not and and you know do the best you can again you're not always going to make people happy so a selectman's board with John Erickson what would be the biggest difference that you would hope you could bring? The biggest difference is I think I would bring an independent perspective and I don't think it's 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 a stretch to say that there hasn't been much if any diversity of opinion of late on that board and I bring an informed educated um, view towards towards things. I bring an experience that's you know hasn't existed on the Board of Selectmen, in, at least in recent years or decades. So um, I, I, bring, I bring, again, what I brought to the, to the school board, which is a different perspective, uh, heavy experience in town government, an ability to collaborate with other board members that don't always agree, but if you're trying to do the best thing for the town of Milford, you work together towards a common goal. And that is to do the best for the town of Milford. Now, you threw down the gauntlet. i got to challenge it. When you say there's not been a diversity of opinion, what is that based on? Based on the, the you know, it, it varies. It bases, it's based on, you know, the, and I'm going to choose these words as they were recounted last year, the current majority of the Board of Selectmen, which has never disagreed on a vote, and then if you... Never disagreed? Yes, never disagreed. Not Never disagreed during a public, during a, forget about executive because I don't have the, right. the privy to that information. Hasn't disagreed on a public vote. Ah, so now I understand what you mean by no diversity. And, you know, the current board um, has rarely, if ever, disagreed. It's, it's, there's, there seems to be a lot of profound parallel thinking because there's been some controversial decisions on that board. And most, if not all of them, have been done with little to no discussion. So to make, to make decisions of that nature that, that affect this community in many ways without discussion, I just, I'm not buying into this that much profound parallel thinking, but that's my perspective. Do you think that's healthy? No. You know, I think in order for this community to, be, to thrive and be completely healthy, we need members on every board 
that are a good cross section of this society or this community. They don't need to, dis to always agree with the Board of Selectmen, but we've taken people off of boards where they were longtime members without explanation and when there were still vacancies in one, in one instance. We've taken some foremost experts in a certain topic off of a board in which they contribute without explanation and when they didn't ask to be taken off of that, that board. I mean, I don't, I certainly won't mention names in this interview. I would go to, I, I, I don't no want to, I don't want to go drive down into the weeds, but these are decisions that, that I disagree with, that um, this, bo these, this board has offered no explanation for, uh, even when, you know, the gauntlet was laid down to them requesting on several occasions an explanation. If you're going to do the best you can for the town of Milford, if you're going to make a decision that you're going to stand behind and say it's in the best interest of the town of Milford, you need to explain your decision, in my mind. And That's what that, I would bring forward. And on that, I'll ask a question. John, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? Well, hopefully you've tuned in for the last 59 minutes yeah. or so. Uh, again, I think it's my somewhat unique combination of experience with town government, learning it from the inside out, um, my experience as a business owner, my uh, service as an elected member of the school committee, that, and, and what I've demonstrated in those roles, not just putting those roles down on paper, but the decisions I've made that I stand behind and I have for 15 years, um, and I would explain to anyone at any time that um, I hope you'll have the confidence to vote for me, John Erickson, as your next selectman in Milford. And as always, I've made a commitment that I'll never ask you to vote for any candidate, but I'll beg you to become informed and get out and vote. I mean, I kid about I want different segments of Milford to get up and have a bigger say. I want all of Milford to have a say. Uh, we've lived through elections of 12 and 13 percent of our voters turning out. I, I don't understand. Please get to know, especially this year, for the love of God, you got seven people who said, I want to help on the school committee, two selectmen. Get out, get to know these people. Pick the one that you feel is more like you, is more likely to help Milford, and then show up and vote. As always, to our six loyal viewers, may tomorrow be a better night than tonight. God bless, good night, and thank you for joining. Thank you, Al. Not too long since I've been home